You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Traditional psychiatry, integrative medicine, or just someone to talk to, Dr. Carly is here to provide moms with personal solutions so that they may experience whole body, mind, and well being at this most extraordinary time of motherhood. Now, please welcome the host of MD for Moms, Dr. Carly Snyder. Welcome. You are listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. I'm a reproductive and perinatal psychiatrist, meaning I work with women struggling with emotional symptoms throughout the reproductive years. I'm also mom to three very sweet kids of my own. This show, MD for Moms, is dedicated to helping women enjoy life more to maximizing health and wellness, and to improving women's relationships with themselves and with others. And throughout the show, I'm going to remind you, you can give us a call if you have a question. The number is 866-451-1451. And we are continuing the series that I, for one, I love, and I think you, I'm hoping you love it too, being the Mama Docs on Call series, where I introduce you to physicians who are also moms like me, and they're here to provide support and information that's really geared to you and your family. And today's show is really, it's quite timely as we finally embark on warmer weather, and that means the summer is around the corner. And if you were to walk into my living room right now, you would know summer was around the corner because it's filled with duffel bags and some minor, mild degree of organization for my kids to go to sleepaway camp. Um, But what comes with summer? Being outdoors, which is awesome, the sun, the fun, right? But ticks and mosquitoes and all of this stuff, which I think every year it becomes more apparent how important it is that we are aware of what does it look like to have a tick on you? What does it look like to – how do you get it off? What does it mean if if your child is bitten by a tick and you miss it? What is Lyme disease? All of these things and – are mosquitoes dangerous? Well, yeah, they are. But how about in you know the continental U.S.? What do we have to worry about? These are things that we are going to learn from Dr. Delilah Restrepo, who is a New York City ID doctor, infectious disease. And I'm so psyched you're here. Welcome. I'm here. Welcome. Hi. So- thank you. I am so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to have you on. Now, before we go into the lovely world of ticks, and I have to just make a quick aside. When I was um, prepping for the show, I was looking on, you know, for images. And boy, those tick pictures, I started itching as if I were looking for at l- pictures of lice, which, by the way, there's nothing that makes me itch more than either thinking of or looking at pictures of lice. But I started just feeling like creepy crawlers all over me. So... You know, just saying, throwing it out there. But anyway, before we talk about ticks, I think our listeners would love to know what you do and how you chose to do it. Sure, Carly. So um, I chose infectious disease, I think, for many reasons. One of them is because I did my training in Latin America, and I was basically exposed to many tropical illnesses, and a lot of the people that we saw ill were actually infected. So it kind of sparked that interest for infectious diseases. Then I came back to New York City, and I trained at 
Elmhurst Hospital, and Elmhurst happens to be a nucleus, a neighborhood in, in New York City that is the most multi-culturally diverse neighborhood. I think somewhere in the New York Times, um, it was like it, it was noted, right, because it was it was just such a diverse area. Um, and so I was really, I mean, exposed to again a lot of illnesses and tropical illnesses, even though I was still in 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 the Big Apple. Um, and then I also trained in the 90s, which was a very very interesting time uh, to train in the HIV world um, because all of a sudden we had uh, medications, um, people were living longer, and now we were actually kind of learning more about this virus and how does it mutate, how does it become resistant, and, and um, so many other aspects of it. Um, and so I think all of this combination mm, just led me to, to infectious diseases. Uh, now, what is infectious disease? So if um, you know, people probably think of us as kind of in a lab and working more as microbiologists, um, and it there it could be some of that. But there's also there infectious disease doctors work in a whole realm of of uh, of part of of healthcare. So it's kind of difficult to pinpoint exactly where it is uh, where where we have our hands. It's a very vast field. It's really the human kind of the relationship between humans and microbiology, and it affects many areas of healthcare. So everywhere from the individual level, uh, where one person gets ill from an infection, so that's one side of it. We also help hospitals design protocols to keep uh, the the whole um, uh, kind of hospital infection control and keep safety as far as infection uh, for their employers, for the patients inside the hospital, for example. Um, and at a macro level, we're, we um, help design strategies and policies to keep the public health, which is kind of more like what the CDC and the NIH and, and these kind of organizations that are more well known, this is what you do. So, so there's different levels that we can, we can affect. I'm a clinician, which means I deal with the individual who becomes infected. Um, my job is really to determine whether there is an infection, number one, that's probably the biggest uh, part of my job. And then if there is one, what is the best way to treat it? What is the best way to eradicate this bacteria or bug or microbe without destabilizing the entire ecosystem of this patient, right? So I think that's really kind of uh, boils down to what I do day to day. Now, um, we also do a lot of prevention because if you know how somebody's going to get ill or someone's going to get infected, then you also know how to prevent it. So I do a lot of prevention in the way of pre-travel consultation. So before mm. people are going to travel and expose themselves to other bacteria mm. and other organisms all over the world, I help prepare them for that trip. And also in the way of HIV and STD prevention, which we now can do quite a bit, um, and it's becoming a very exciting field um, in, in the prevention of HIV as well. So That's, I mean, I will say personally, I remember I think in medical school, so well, I know in, in medical school that I had, um, I was on the medicine floor and a patient, I had to draw um, hepatitis labs on him, which lots and lots, you know, lots and lots of blood. And he right. was being discharged. He had come in with the fevers of unknown origin and he wanted to leave and like he was ready to go. And I was taking up time because I was taking, you know, all this blood. And he actually took the needle out of his arm and put it in my hand. And subsequently, we found out that he had Hep C and HIV two, and was that was the source of his fevers of unknown origin. And so I was on a crazy, crazy prophylactic regimen for the HIV, and I had this fabulous infectious disease fellow who was so great about you know researching. Because HIV-2 is not something for our listeners that, that's, you know, very common right. in – except where this one man was from. And it was – she really – I think of her as like my life saver because she really figured it out. And they were not easy drugs. They still aren't, I'm sure. But the one one of the ones I was on actually is off the market now, um, Sestiva. It was horrible. But she was awesome. I mean she just – so I have a very warm place in my heart for infectious disease clinicians because, you know, my experience was so ultimately positive. It was a very difficult thing. And then I remember the following year 
we had a patient who had turned out to have miliary TB, which is, uh, you know, tuberculosis. And the ID people were so awesome and so on top of it. And I was, I, I was in awe and I remain in awe of what you do. So, so there oh, you go. Absolutely. I mean, most people won't need our help in, in their lifetime, but when they do, um, it is very much appreciated because we do have a grasp of this microbiome world where not everybody, you know, can even pronounce the names of many of these genus and species. And so it does bring um, a lot of value. Um, definitely infectious disease consultants save lives, and when we get into the um, cases early, we probably save a lot of money, too, in, in diagnostic workups. So it's uh, we're definitely, uh, I'm glad to hear that you had a positive experience. I did. It was, I mean, it was a hard experience, but it was, it was definitely a good one. Now, you know, we're not going to focus on HIV today, but I am curious to know, you said, you know, it's an exciting time. I, my understanding, you know, so there's the preventative treatment options. Are there new um, medications, uh, antiretrovirals, et cetera, to prolong someone's healthy life before they become truly ill? Oh, absolutely. So HIV today um, is very different than um, 30 years ago, right? Uh, so today we have numerous options. Um, each time they get even more safe, more easy to tolerate, uh, less dosing per day. Um, and it really has come to the point where HIV nowadays is a chronic disease. So that is incredible compared to where we started, where really patients were dying and we had nothing to offer. Um, so nowadays, you know, it, your longevity, if you are to become HIV positive in 2018, your longevity really won't change. And that's huge. And when you look at mathematical models, I mean, you could have a six-year reduction in your lifespan, but that is not even anything compared to how we used to. And when you look at uh, patients that don't have the hepatitis C or don't have malignancy or other things on, uh, in addition to HIV, you really, it, 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 it becomes a chronic illness. So it, it has now revolutionized to the way that these are most of my chronic patients in, in the office are really... Um, on one pill once a day, which is also incredible, and a very safe and, and well-tolerated pill once a day. Um, so, yes, this is it definitely is a, an interesting time. That's a long way from AZT. Um, it is a long way from AZT. That is correct. I mean, whew. now, do you think there's ever going to be a vaccine, an injectable vaccine? I absolutely vaccine? think so. Um, I think that... Science is moving very, very fast. I think um, years ago we wouldn't even dream of treating hepatitis C, and now hepatitis C is a curable disease. So I think in the same way we will probably see some major advancements in HIV. Um, what's important is that, you know, one thing is the research that happens in virology and microbiology, but also um, any research that happens in immunology, oncology, for example, is a booming field, also cross-pollinates. And so I think that um, the, as we get better understanding of the immune system and all these reservoirs and all of these areas where we know that HIV hides in the body and it's the reason why it's so difficult also to eradicate, um, we will have a better understanding of the disease at, at, a, at a cellular level and be able to um, have something better to offer, whether it's curative or vaccine for prevention um, remains to be seen, but definitely the, the field is growing. It's so cool. And, you know, I, I think even the fact that we can treat it, hep C, which is interesting because I recall I was very scared that I was going to have HIV when in reality I was at much higher risk for hepatitis. But I didn't, you know, at the time, Correct. which was a long time ago, I, you know, especially I think in my, in, in our generation growing up, the fear was HIV, right? That was hammered into us. So I didn't even think about the hepatitis aspect, which was far, far more of a risk. But now it's cure. It's, it is a curable thing. It's very cool. 
Well, we have to take a brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are speaking to infectious disease physician, Dr. Delilah Restrepo. And after the break, we are going to talk about the creepy crawly ticks and Lyme disease and more fun stuff, really important stuff as we go into the summer. So stay tuned. Hi, my name is Myra Fox, and I am a survivor. I am the founder of the Castle Lewis I Survived Foundation and the author of a series of books entitled I Survived a Murder Untold, which tells the story of my sister and I who were abandoned and left in the care of a woman who beat us repeatedly. Unfortunately, it resulted in the death of my sister, Castle Lewis, which is revealed in a page-to-page chilling story. After spending time in the foster care system, I've documented my suffering and my loss and ultimately my survival. I'm blessed to work daily in my community and surrounding areas to give back by helping others and feeding the homeless. I want to spread awareness of the dangers of abuse. You can purchase my books and contribute to the Castle Lewis I Survive Foundation by visiting www.castlelewis.com or you can call us at 540-999-8401. Thank you. French Rastafarian baker Chef Oug Mat is a fourth-generation baker and has worked in 11 countries across three continents. Born in Mulhouse, France, he began apprenticing in his father's bakery at age 12 and has devoted his life to learning cultures of the world from inside kitchens across the globe. He also teaches traditional French baking by hosting demonstrations and classes, and his passion for baking is reflected in his delicious confections. With a deep respect for discipline and his Rastafarian way of life, Chef Uvmat exemplifies commitment to tradition and culture in a global world. Traveling extensively and combining a myriad of flavors into his recipes, Chef Uvmat brings a unique approach to baking. To read more about the French Rastafarian baker, visit www.frenchchefoug.com. That's H-U-G-U-E-S. Bon appétit and bless up. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and we are speaking to New York City infectious disease physician, Dr. Delilah Restrepo. And if you have a question, give us a call, 866-451-1451. Now, ticks. I will say, if we're going to go full disclosure, I just spent way too much money, or it seems like it, on having my property sprayed for ticks because I am very scared of them. Um, And, you know, whether or not that will actually do any good, time will tell. But every year it seems that they say, you know, there's some they, it kind of says, at least in the Northeast, this is going to be the worst tick season ever. Is that true this year? Carly, I think it's true every year. (laughs) Um, it may be because obviously I have bias. Um, this is what I see, but I honestly, ticks are, ticks are here and ticks are here to stay and ticks any are everywhere in the world except Antarctica. So unless you're there, um, the rest of us really, this is something we have to deal with. Um, it is thought that it is probably one of the um, consequences of global warming actually, right? So, um, every time we find more, more and more Ticks are around more species. Um, they're transmitting more diseases. People are becoming, um, getting in contact with them more often, not just in the summer, et cetera. So there definitely is that climactic um, um, effect on it. Um, every year we brace ourselves, and I think that, you know, it has been just such a particularly warm winter that I wouldn't, uh, it's hard to predict really what the tick season is going to be like, but I don't anticipate that it'll be uh, a quiet one. Um, So having said that, (laughs) I think, um, yes, I don't have like any hardcore evidence that it is going to be a worse one, but I I think, you know, all the climactic changes are there to, 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 to expect that we're going to have problems to deal with. Now, I think, you know, Uh, People, is there any way then to avoid tick exposure? I mean, realistically? 
Yeah, so I mean, definitely um, just knowing they, they like to live in grassy fields, right? So um, mostly we're going to come in contact with them when we're out hiking and bushes that are really high and, and kind of um, very warm and moist, right? That's where they like to be. So so just taking some precautions for tick precautions, it's really, um, it's, it's really the way to go. So protective clothing for sure. Um, and if you're going to walk on a hiking path, then try to stay in the center of the path, not just not around the periphery where you're going to be more exposed to bushy areas. Um, and and using tick repellents also um, can help uh, to to prevent. I think the biggest help is really when you come back indoors and you do your tick checks, which is really um, part of the um, the biggest prevention met, um, strategy you can take. And you know, what if let's say you find a tick on your child? Well, the first question is when you do a tick check, what is it that you should be looking for? And what, you know, and what should you do if you find one? Right. So the tick checks are, um, they're very important. They're very important in our kids, especially. They're important for us, too, but our kids won't, you know, they, they need our help for that. Um, so what you're looking for are really very minuscule. They're going to be tiny, tiny ticks because, remember, they are um, they're, they're small and they get engorged when they feed. So when they feed on us and they um, become full of blood, I know it sounds a bit gruesome, but when that happens, then they become at a bigger size. But when you're first looking at them, when you come back in from indoors, they're going to be very tiny. So you're looking for very tiny ticks. Um, don't, um, don't forget the hairline, um, your underarms, um, certainly areas um, between your legs, um, be- behind the kneecaps, for example. Like These are all areas that maybe we'll forget. We're, we tend more to look like at the peripheral and things that are evident, but uh, they travel and they walk. And so even though they may have hopped on in your ankle, they're going to travel up your leg. So you can't forget these other areas. Now, will you feel it or will your child feel that or not? Uh, not necessarily. Um, some ticks tend to cause more um, an, a local irritation and can and can develop a little bit of pruritus or itching, um, and so you could feel that one. But no, not necessarily. Sometimes they will latch on and you won't see them. And then remember, they're going to attach, they're going to feed, and then when they're nice and plump, they're going to just fall off, and you may not feel it. Well, let's say I find one, right, and it's, it's plump. It, it's like clearly doing its thing. What is the safest way to remove it? So the the safest way to remove it is, um, the, the, uh, and there are YouTube videos on this, by the way. But you're going to attach the, you're going to grab the tick with the tweezers, and you're going to pull up perpendicularly. So basically, it's like you have a uh, a bug with their claws inside you, which is not really claws, but but attached on you. So you want to um, remove it perpendicularly to the skin with a quick uh, a quick kind of yank, um, and if you can try to save that tick also because we can identify what type of tick and that can help us also figure out um, what type of diseases this kind of tick could have transmitted, right? Because not all of them transmit the same ones. So that can be helpful. The other thing we do sometimes is give um, prophylaxis with antibiotic at that time that you have removed the tick. So um, if you find a tick and you remove it properly, and it's not engorged yet, and you take a dose of antibiotics, a lot of time you can abort any infection uh, possibility right there and then without having to worry about anything later on. So finding the tick actually does give you several points in time to intervene before the infection takes, takes its course. Now, do you think it's a good idea? I've heard some people um, suggest that everybody take you know, a dose or two or whatever of, you know, amoxicillin or whatever specifically in like October. Is that a good idea or not so much? Not so much because if you've been exposed in August or in July, then one dose is not going to be the right strategy. The only way that helps is if it's really 
you identify the tick and it's at this time. So um, uh, if if, you've, if an infection has already ensued, then it's not going to be helpful to just take one dose. So those kind of strategies are, are not usually recommended. And if anything, um, we worry about destabilizing your normal flora and, and all the perils of antibiotics. And um, so those kind of general measures are usually not recommended. That well, that makes sense. Now, <clears throat> it's not. You said that you know there are different ticks can transmit different things. Um, I will say, last year I was in my garden. I walked inside and I felt something kind of tickling my arm, and I looked down and it turns out it was a Lone Star tick, which number one is very hard to kill. Like we got it mm-hmm. off me real fast, and then that thing did not want to die. But they're also <laughs> quite striking looking. I mean, they they are they're not so small. Um, but they also can really transmit a, uh, for some, would I guess, a devastating illness. For me, as a vegan, it really wouldn't upset me so much. But can you explain what a Lone Star tick can transmit? Sure. Um, so there are several types of ticks. Um, for the most part, we identify them as uh, Lone Star tick is um, – it's an, actually one of the prettier ones because it has a big white dot in the back. Uh, yeah. there's a, there are dog ticks uh, or derma center, and there's the exodes tick or the deer tick, right? So each kind of each one of these families transmits different things. That lone star tick actually has a characteristic that its saliva is very irritating. So the lesions that a lone star tick can produce are usually much more itchy and bothersome. So a lot of times people tell me, oh, you know, they're very worried because they saw a lone star tick and it's such an itchy and annoying kind of bite. But that's not the tick that's going to transmit Lyme and the other and, and Babesia or Lichia. So the lone star tick is, um, can transmit tularemia, it can transmit things like ehrlichia, it can transmit Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which is another very aggressive viral illness. Um, so it definitely has the potential. Um, but again, these are not um, as, they're, they're not associated with kind of that prolonged and protracted and fearsome um, uh, consequence of, of Lyme disease. The dog tick um, is um, more commonly seen. It's, it looks a little bit bigger. It can also transmit uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever um, and tularemia, but it also has another characteristic which can do something called tick paralysis. Now, tick Oof. paralysis is a very funky kind of disease because it really presents with paralysis and it's a rather acute presentation, so it's very scary. And the treatment is removing the tick. That's it, because there's actually a neurotoxin in the saliva of that tick that produces, um, that results in that paralysis. So the treatment is just to get that tick off you. So um, it's part of, you know, this we teach to our to our fellows and, and our residents in the summer. It's if somebody comes in with a paralysis, you have to do a full, full exam, because if you find a tick somewhere, that's it. Um, and so, so that's a very funky characteristic of the dog tick. The deer tick is the one that, you know, we speak about uh, mostly, and it's Ixodes tick, and it transmits Lyme and Babesiosis and human granulocytic or Lichiosis, which is a long name for um, just a lot of diseases that can cause anemia, weakness, fever, rash, um, and really we tend to see a lot in, towards the end of summer. So, um, so that's the, the, the one that we worry about the most here in the Northeast, at least. Which is the one that can ba- make you allergic to meat? Oh, that's a good question. Um, that is, if I'm not mistaken, it is Derma Center that can make you allergic to meat. But I, I don't recall exactly what the pathophysiology is or what the mechanism for that is. Oh, as I said, it's not something I was really worried about, but I remember we looked it up and my husband was like, oh my God, that would be the worst thing in the world. And I was like, no, it really wouldn't. But, you know, for him, <laughs> if it you're was. a vegan, I um, guess it wouldn't. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, of any, of anything, it really wasn't upsetting to me. Um, but that the paralysis, that must be really scary if you don't know what you're looking. I mean, and that obviously can impact a child as much as an adult. 
Oh, yes, absolutely. It's a neurotoxin mediated reaction. So, um, so it really is. A, it's like a you know a, a bite with a with a toxin in it in the saliva. So, it, it's a direct correlation to that. Wow, that well, it's good that we know, right? Because that could be really scary if there's acute onset of paralysis. Well, we have to take another brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on iHeartRadio and the BBM Global Network. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Sutter. And after the break, we are going to talk more about really Lyme disease specifically and mosquito-borne illnesses. It turns out I think mosquitoes are one of the top, if not the top killers um, by virtue of the illnesses they transmit. But we're going to learn more. So stay tuned. America is out of control. Today's capitalism and the approach to money is in fact a symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. Do you battle with weight loss? There is a solution. Founder of Weight No More Consulting, Deborah Simons, can help you lose weight safely and effectively through weight loss surgery. I know. I had the surgery two years ago, and I am 135 pounds lighter and medication-free. This full-service weight loss center caters to your every need as you navigate to a healthy weight following surgery. Servicing all of Canada, Weight No More Consulting takes pride in its compassionate care and guides you through each step before and after surgery. Starting with informational meetings, Weight No More Consulting educates each potential client before they decide to have surgery on the health risks of obesity and the various weight loss surgeries available. After surgery, Weight No More Consulting provides a solid support system with ongoing meetings to ensure continued success. Deborah Simons and Weight No More Consulting are committed to promoting your health and wellness through maintaining a healthy weight for life. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are speaking to Dr. Delilah Restrepo, who is an infectious disease specialist. If you have a question for her, give us a call, 866-451-1451. So, Lyme disease. What should parents for, you know, both ourselves and our kids, what should people be looking for? Because, you know, we all think like, oh, the... Bullseye rash, I think, is something of a well-known under, you know, concept. But what does that actually mean, and how often does someone present with it? Well, actually, we do see quite a bit of, of uh, target lesions, is what we call it, right? Or erythema migrans. It's like the, the the classic red redness around. It's a red halo around the area where you got bit with the tick. And it tends to clear uh, um, from the from the center out, so the center will become pale and before the edges, so it, it look it has that pale center and the red kind of halo around it. Um, and we we see a lot of it. It's just um, it, a lot of patients after they've been diagnosed with Lyme. Sometimes it's taken longer. Sometimes they don't remember it, um, or this is why it kind of gets that bad rap. But actually, a lot of people do report itching or, or something bothersome around the around the area of the tick. So, um, so definitely, you know, still look out for for any lesion. Um, what you're looking for really is um, is like the symptoms that follow that lesion, which the lesion is bothersome on the skin, but it won't really affect the rest of you. So, three or you know, three three days to a couple of days later, you can have fever, rash. Um, um, chills, headaches, joint aches, swollen lymph nodes. You start to not feel well, right? So, it, and it's it, it, all of these symptoms sound exactly like with whatever mosquito-borne illness or influenza or any any other kind of 
uh, infectious disease starts out with fever, chills, headache, joint aches, right? So, um, so there, it's rather nonspecific. Um, and then uh, that's really when, when most people seek medical attention. And let's say you don't. Right. So let's say you uh, you're like, oh, I have the flu in the middle of the summer or whatever. You know, you kind of just chalk it up to being sick. What are the implications of not treating Lyme disease like right away? Right. So so the natural illness of the, the natural progression of this is that, you know, if you miss that initial flu like time, uh, days or months later, you can start to have kind of those, those late uh, presentations of Lyme, which can involve things like a severe headache and stiffness. So it's kind of more like meningitis uh, or severe joint pains and now swelling. So it's not just the joint is achy, but it, you actually have a swollen joint, um, warm, red, and, and arthritis and really infl- inflammatory changes in that joint. Um, you can have a facial palsy, and this we see quite a lot. So it's like paralysis of a side of your face. So whenever people are diagnosed with a Bell's palsy, et cetera, or, you know, um, we always test for Lyme because these can be late neurologic findings of Lyme. Um, Lyme can also affect your heart. So some people can have irregular heartbeats or very slow heartbeats um, to the point that sometimes people need hospitalization to monitor that bradycardia, which is just a very slow uh, um, heartbeat. Um, And then also shooting pains, numbness um, can happen. So I get a lot of referrals, for example, from neurology uh, colleagues where they've been working someone up for, for shooting pains or numbness in their hands and feet or things that are kind of, can look kind of nonspecific. And, and after a full workup, what you find is that they actually have Lyme, um, Lyme evidence of Lyme disease on, in their blood test. Now, do you – people talk a lot, and, and I think there's a lot of um, – there are a lot of uh, proposed treatments et cetera, for chronic Lyme. But the, the flip side is that I've also heard a lot of naysayers on this. What are your thoughts on this – on the on the concept of chronic Lyme. So chronic Lyme is is a it's a very controversial topic. Um, chronic the the term chronic Lyme is a very loose term, and it really is just for. It's been given to people that have symptoms after they've been documented to have Lyme and treated for Lyme. So the new uh, definition or the or the mo- the more proper definition is really post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. So it means you're having symptoms after you've been treated, um, and they can be very nonspecific, right? So it could be fatigue, joint pain, muscle aches. Um, a lot of my patients report something like brain fog. The minute I hear brain fog, that sounds very much like a post-treatment kind of syndrome. Um, Studies haven't shown that necessarily continuing treatment for the bacteria, for, for Borrelia, for Lyme, for the, for the bug itself makes any difference. And so we're not really sure what it is that caused this, but we're saying chronic Lyme kind of implies that you're, you have persistent bacteria in your system going on and on and on. And really what it seems to be like, what seems to be happening is that there are no more bacteria there. Let's just say everything's been sterilized with antibiotics, but you have this phenomena that lingers longer and it could be really protracted and it may be more immunologic, more inflammatory. There may be something else going on. So perhaps that initial infection kind of did something to your immune system that threw things off, but it's not necessarily that there's persistent bacteria in there that make sense? Yeah. Now, let's say someone has that scenario. What treatment options exist for them, if any? Right. So we've all seen patients with, um, with uh, symptoms past the, the, the treatment phase. Um, this is a definite entity. It is actually quite incapacitating. Um, it's, it's, a big, it's a big issue to see a patient suffering with this because it can last Six months. It can last a year. I mean, some people, you know, these are some some people were healthy before, and they've missed now semesters of college or their jobs or their family struggling. Like it can be really incapacitating. 
it's hard to recommend the proper treatment when we don't yet understand what it is that causes it. So a lot of us, you know, we, we we're kind of faced with just trying to do a multidisciplinary approach and trying to improve lifestyle, improve diet, um, stress reduction, um, adjuvant measures like supplements, like meditation, um, anything else that we can possibly help to in to minimize inflammation to control stress to minimize any other factor that could be possibly adding to this to the constellation of symptoms but there really isn't a magic wand for the post treatment syndrome at all um not as of yet and research is ongoing but it's taken us even a while to um, to come to this point of defining this properly so it could be studied, right? So it's it's still an area of research. I mean, and I, I've heard of people having some really, I mean, doing some pretty extensive uh, treatment that's, you know, with mi- mixed results, we'll say. Let's go there. Um, mm-hmm. But it sounds like it's a pretty scary thing if that happens. Um, so... I think we can take away from this that if you have any sense that maybe you or your child has Lyme, just go get checked because it's not such a big deal to get checked, but it's a big deal to miss it or to wait. I mean, in truth, it sounds like you could also be treated fully and there's really little you can do to control the risk for ongoing symptoms. Um, but you can hope. Yes. And and it also <laughs> can happen with other other infections too because sometimes you know even post um, mononucleosis you can see these protracted kind of uh, um, symptoms that just they they're, they're, they stay for six months or so and they just totally destabilize you even though you are no longer harboring this virus or this bacteria or whatever else it is in your body so definitely our immune systems take a hit. And I think that aftermath is really what you deal with sometimes after infections. And, and um, it's just uh, some, some people, um, some, some doctors use prolonged antibiotics for this kind of uh, scenario. And it really, even though some patients report improvement while they're on the antibiotics, remember antibiotics have an anti-inflammatory effect to them. So yeah. no matter what, you kind of tend to feel better. But what it's doing to your microbiome and to your normal flora can be much more devastating and difficult to deal with than really the benefit you're going to be um, obtaining from them. So in, in my practice, I tend to use a multidisciplinary approach with lifestyle changes. And as long as you're ruling out anything else, because that's important, you know, you can't chuck all of these symptoms to just post Lyme. So it's important to have a full physical and, and talk to have a good um, physical examination, talk to your doctor, and maybe see a couple of specialists to make sure that you're ruling out other things. But once that is there, at least it gives you one reassurance that there is nothing else more severe going on, and now you can focus on maybe just uh, your lifestyle changes and try to try to do it that way, um, for just much more sane and stepwise fashion. That makes sense. Now, how about mosquitoes, right? I mean, they're annoying as anything, um, but they're also potentially dangerous, right? D- does that depend on where you are in terms of in the country or the world? It very much does. Um, we are a bit lucky in that regard up here. So in the Northeast, um, we don't have as many tropical mosquitoes that transmit so many um, dangerous uh, in viral infections, et cetera. But we, again, global warming, so that changes a bit. So although um, we don't have necessarily the same mosquitoes as in the Caribbean, um, we have cousins of those mosquitoes which aren't as effective in transmitting infections, but they are here and they can. Um, And giving the right climactic situation, you can potentially have an emerging pathogen. Um, So so yes, not all mosquitoes are created equal or transmit the same Mm -hmm. things, but, um, but definitely we need mosquito repellent even though we're in the Northeast. And, you know, I think mosquitoes recently got a lot of press, so to speak, about Zika, at least in the past few years. Where where are we now with the whole Zika situation? Right. So Zika, um, in 2018, um, so far, there has been no Zika in U.S. territory and mainland. So at least um, we're, we're okay locally at home with that. Um, 
Bahamas and Cayman Islands is currently disease free um, as of the last uh, last check um, uh, in the global surveillance. So that's important, too, because I have a lot of patients that tell me, where can I go? I'm planning a family, and I, which island can I go? And I used to send them to Iceland, but I think now <laughs> Bahamas and Cayman Islands is opened up, so that's good. Um, but, I mean, it's, you know, it, it, um, it certainly is something that couples that are planning a pregnancy need to keep in mind. Um, and we know this from even the time of malaria, right? So if you're planning to be pregnant, we recommend women don't go to malarious regions and change their itinerary because if you can, um, the, the consequences are very are devastating if you acquire Zika during, during pregnancy or, or can be. Um, so... Lisa, you got two places you can go on that baby moon, but and <laughs> what about when kids are like a year in or two old? Do you still have to take the same precautions for them in terms of as when you were pregnant? I mean, are there still? I've heard both sides of this. Um, you know, we all know, like the well, we don't all know, but the first year of life, there's a huge amount of growth in a baby's brain. Um, how much can they be affected by Zika? But before we go there, we're going to take a brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on iHeartRadio and the BBM Global Network. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center. And after the break, we are going to learn the answer from Dr. Delilah Restrepo about do you have to worry about Zika for your one or two year old or three year old? Stay tuned to find out. Dr. Rob Moyer is the director of the Ocean River Institute, and he is passionate about saving the ocean by helping dolphins suffering from nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen is a dangerous pollutant, affecting our oceans, altering ocean ecosystems, and contributing to global warming. The Ocean River Institute provides opportunities to make a difference and encourages people to go the distance for savvy stewardship of a greater and bluer planet Earth. Partnered with organizations from Massachusetts to Florida, Alaska to the Caribbean, the Ocean River Institute's mission is to foster involvement in conservation and environmental monitoring by facilitating grassroots efforts at local and regional levels. Hello, I'm Rob Moyer of the Ocean River Institute. Please visit our website at oceanriver.org. Sign up for free e-alerts. You may call us at 617-661-6647. Our email address is info at Ocean River. Become informed and then act with us. Thank you. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and today we are speaking to New York City-based infectious disease expert, Dr. Delilah Restrepo. And right before the break, I posed the question whether Zika, whether we should really consider Zika when planning a trip with our toddler or our infant. You know, are they potentially impacted by Zika given that now they are no longer in utero. Right, Carly. So um, so one of the biggest um, consequences of, of Zika, now remember, most of Zika infections are going to be just a, a self-limited fever, rash, and kind of flu-like symptoms, the same way that, that pr- pr- practically every viral illness presents. But 
but the feared consequences for the few percentage of those that go on to that is going to be um, certainly something. Um, there, there have been links to Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is kind of an ascending paralysis and weakness with ner- weakness uh, syndrome with nerve damage. Um, so, so that can obviously present at any time, and we fear that in adults as well, right? So, so that would be something to 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 be um, careful with with our kids. The birth defect, though, is really something that has to happen during your while your organs are being formed so um, microcephaly or that small head circumference uh, and the neurologic consequences that come from having a small head circumference really and, and, and um, having your brain not develop properly is something that would be more during pregnancy if the infection were acquired during pregnancy but that encephalitis that's scary nobody wants that um, nobody wants gamber either right yeah well, I mean, yeah, no kidding. Um, now, what what suggestions do you have for couples who, you know, are considering having a baby? Maybe, you know, and she's not pregnant yet, but in the next few months, there really is a possibility of a of pregnancy. What? How do you um, counsel people in those scenarios? So the the particular thing about Zika and um, and. Uh, actually, something that, you know, Zika, uh, we're learning a lot now about this because this is an emerging pathogen. We have seen Zika outbreaks before, but never like this. And so, um, for example, the, the microcephaly or the, the birth defects are something that's kind of particular to this current outbreak or the one from 2015 to now. But another very particular characteristic of Zika is that it spreads mainly through mosquito bites, but not only through mosquito bites. It can also spread through sex. Um, So unprotected sex with someone who has the infection um, can transmit Zika. So you could be here in New York City and not worry because you didn't move or whatnot, but your sexual partner may have been in the Caribbean or Brazil or somewhere where Zika is endemic and bring it back. And even though, remember I said, a lot of these patients, they're not going to develop Guillain-Barre or anything of big consequence. They could have just had a flu-like symptom while they were away and then come back and still have the Zika virus in their semen or in their bodily fluids and be able to transmit it. Um, so, so even for, so you just, you know, you have to be careful even though you've only been here. Um, so one of the things I, well, one of the things we recommend is for pregnant women. So if you're pregnant, avoid travel to any area that has Zika um, circulating. If you must go, then wear insect repellent and use condoms. And if symptoms develop, like fever, rash, headache, joint pains, pink eye. Pink eye, actually conjunctivitis is a very particular uh, characteristic of Zika. Um, And so if you develop any of these, um, definitely get tested. But for the most part, if you can avoid travel, definitely we say to avoid travel. And the for couples, preconception or even during pregnancy, because remember, um, preconception, well, you're going to have sex because you're trying to conceive, but um, also during pregnancy, you don't want to acquire this infection during pregnancy. So if your male partner traveled to Zika area, then the recommendation is to wait six months to have condomless sex. Uh, and to plan a uh, family. Um, six months is a really long time, so it is a yes. family planning you know, decision as a, as a group because it's a long time. And the reason it's six months is because there is evidence that there could be semen, uh, uh, Zika, sorry, shedding in the semen up to that long. So, um, so for, if the male partner is traveling, we recommend waiting six months. So there's an, a buffer. Um, if the female partner is traveling, then we recommend waiting two months since the last exposure. So there doesn't seem to be that, that persistent shedding in females as in men. So if for, for women, um, they can wait just two months after returning. If both have traveled, then the recommendation is obviously to wait six months, so the longest to conceive. Um, and there is still no treatment or vaccine available for this infection. So really prevention is going to be key. Now, you know, which if, bug spray, you know, because at least... 
when it comes to a lot of things. I mean, I've put bug spray on and I feel like, you know, it does a whole lot of nothing. I've like put it on, walked outside and then, you know, a mosquito has landed on my arm. Um, which kind of bug spray do you suggest is the best? Right. So I am old school in X in when it comes to insect repellents and I think DEET is still the way to go because you are going to have your most protection with DEET. Um, it is safe in babies older than two months um, and it it really offers the best protection for ticks and mosquitoes. Um, the downside of DEET is that it well, the easier downside is that it can damage clothes and leather, so you have to be careful with that. Um, and also, in, when ingested, there's the possibility of seizure. So this is why um, people try to stay away from DEET. Another option is oil lemon eucalyptus, um, and this is becoming much more popular. Um, it seems a bit more natural, but uh, not everything that is natural is is safe, right? So um, it can cause really substantial eye irritation if it goes into your eyes. So with um, oil, lemon, eucalyptus, you just have to be very careful not to apply it into the eyes. Because of this, um, it is a, is recommended to avoid in younger than three-year-olds. Um, so you, this is not to be used in younger than three-year-olds. So um, so there's that side of it. Picaridine is another one. It comes from black pepper. It's odorless. It doesn't really pose the serious issues that DEET has. Um, it can damage clothes and leather. But the important thing is that whichever one you choose, it's important to cover all your exposed areas and reapply, reapply after water, sweat, um, a lot of activities, um, because that's going to be key. And sunscreen goes first. No, sunscreen first, then repellent. That's the order. Well, this has that is actually really helpful. Um, all of this has been so helpful. This has been such a great show. Thank you so much, Dr. Delilah Restrepo. And really quickly, how can people find you if they're you know in New York City area, for example? So um, I work with ahf.org, uh, so you can find us at ahf.org, and my office is the Columbus Circle, or 30 West 60 Columbus Circle office, um, and yeah, I would uh, love to see you if, any, if I can help anyone. That'd be great. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you so much, and thank you to our listeners for joining us today. Tune in again every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern on iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio and the BBM Global Network. Or you can always download later on iTunes as a podcast. You know, go running and listen to us. Why not? Um, I look forward to hearing from you. You can always email me, cs at carlysnydermd.com, or you can check out my website, carlysnydermd.com, where there are lots of articles about women's mental health and wellness, and hopefully something speaks to you. This has been an episode of MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and until next time, be well, enjoy life, and thanks for listening. You've been listening to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Please join us each and every week for answers to the many challenging issues moms face today on the next episode of Dr. Carly's MD for Moms. been listening to the bbm global network the ideas views and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas views and opinions of the bbm global network company